Shalom, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. We believe the Torah is relevant for our lives today, God's teachings and instructions. You may very well be part of the first generation to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and have the Torah, a Christian with Torah. Join us as we honor the living God through the study of His Word, topical conversations, and interviews with special guests. Please welcome our hosts, Pastor Nick Plummer and Ryan Cabrera. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. I am your co-host, Ryan Cabrera, and uh, I'm in Studio B. Here we are. With this, is, this is Studio B. The Pastor Nick Plummer. Hey, Pastor Nick. It's good to be here. It is It is a blessing. A little change of topic to here. We do have a little change of topic. It's so, not Torah. It's not Matthew. Hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo. But it is Torah. It is Torah. So uh, if you're here for the very first time, first of all, thank you for being here. I don't know how you found us, but you did find us. And so one of the things that you can do to help other people find us is leave some breadcrumbs behind you by subscribing, ringing the bell, sharing, doing all that stuff so other people can find this podcast. Now, um, we are Christians with Torah, so we're exactly what that sounds like. We believe in Yeshua. That's Jesus. He is the Christ, the Messiah, is the Son of God. He is God. And that we also believe that the whole Bible from Genesis to maps is relevant for today and for believers to follow, like an instruction manual, yes. right? That we can pull principles and life lessons out of. And so uh, we've done for the past four years the Torah portions every week where we took all five books of the Bible and we used the portions that are already set out by uh, the Jewish people and uh, used those Torah portions for four years. We've gone through those week in and week out. So you can go back and watch those if you're interested in the Torah portions. Uh, we've been doing Matthew, uh, and we're all the way up to where we've done the first half of chapter 14. And we've been taking that little by little. What is it? Here a little, there a little, a little precept by precept, line upon line. That's right. But today, because of the timeliness, we are going to be talking about the Feast of Shavuot. And uh, what's cool about the Feast of Shavuot is on the Feast of Shavuot, we celebrate the giving of the Torah and the Holy Spirit. That's good. Isn't that exciting? And so we start our study in the book of Exodus, starting in chapter 19, uh, and we're going to look at the giving of the Torah. All right? And the first thing we're going to start out with is verses 1 and 2, and it says this. In the third month... When the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai, had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. So I imagine a big bunch of people traveling through the wilderness, right? We know that this was in the third month, right? We know who it was, so we know the when, we know the who, it's the children of Israel, right? We know where they're going from, they're going from Egypt. And the same day they're going into the wilderness of Sinai, right? And they they decide, hey, this looks like a good place to camp. So take note that it was the third month that God brought the children of Israel to Mount Sinai in the wilderness. And it just so happens the Feast of Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, is celebrated in the third month. Now, is that a coincidence there? I don't think so. And so God did bear the children of Israel on eagles' wings, uh, and brought them to himself, which is what it says in verse 4. Now, we know the, the when, the, the who, the where from and to, right? Where they're traveling from and to. We know that they pitched in the wilderness at Sinai, and that that's where they set up their camp, which I think is a pretty interesting, cool little, little study to see that, hey, the third month, which the first month, according to the biblical calendar, starts at Nisan. That's the month of Passover. Then you have the second month. And then you have the third month. So we've been counting the Omer all this time. Today is day 45, by the way, of the counting of the Omer. And uh, anyway, so let's keep going. Verses 5 and 6. Do you want to read verses 5 and 6 there, Pastor Nick? Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Very interesting. So the Lord wanted his people to hear his voice and keep his covenant. And if they did that, they would be a peculiar treasure above all people. Pretty interesting. Out of all the nations. Now, we're going to break down a couple words here. But the first one I want to look at is I want to look at the word obey. All right. So it says here, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice. You see that? So this word obey, what word do you think that is, Pastor Nick? I don't know. I didn't do a word study on obey. Uh, 
Oh. Yeah, I'm still working on that. Oh, I'm so glad you came to the study today, Pastor oh, Nick. Oh, my goodness. Obey. So this word obey is the word shema. So if you will shema my voice. So in order to obey his voice, you first have to what? It's hear and obey. You have to hear wow. his voice. Hear and obey. So if you will shema my voice, indeed, right? And this is indeed, not in academic study or hear in, and obey. in your brain. Wow. It says, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. So the word peculiar, this is a, a good word, don't you think? Do you like this word? I like it. You like this word? Is the, is the Hebrew word what? Segula. It's a segula. Segula. And it means to shut up, right? To shut up, like to, to close up to tight. Hold on, hold on. Wealth, jewel, and special. You can also find this word in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2, 26, verse 18, and also in the Psalms, in uh, Psalm 135, verse 4. And uh, apparently this is repeated in some way, shape, or form in chapter 19, verse 5 of Matthew. Is that what that is? Uh... That's a good question. It is. It is a good question. Let me look that yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Look that up and let me know what that says. So Matthew nineteen five is. So then also the Lord wanted the children of Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And that's obviously repeated in Matthew nineteen six. Yeah, I don't know why that's there. Yeah, well, here, I'll do one of these. Oh, you know what that is? That's what? supposed to mean Exodus nineteen five. Ah uh, uh, something. Yes, look at that. a little typo. Look at that. Exodus 19.5. Well, and it's similar because that come from? we have the next that verse, so 19.6 in Matthew, is a verse because that's where it's repeated that we're going to be a kingdom of priests and a whole well, nation. Well, 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9, that should be Exodus 19.6. Uh, wow, Exodus I didn't, I didn't even notice that. Yeah. A little typos as we're doing. You know, that's good, though. That we yeah, you know, my, uh, my wife's going out of town. I had to just text some things here. Um, but... Um, it's all working out. It is all working out. Because, you God. know, if you don't have good communication, they go out of town. It's well, like, oh, no. I'm under the impression that if you have eight children and not all of them are going with her, then there might be some coordination that has to happen there, you think? The wandering. Just maybe. Ephraimites. <laughs> all right. So I'm reading this and I'm trying to understand exactly what it is that we're supposed to get out of this, right? And so I was um, very impressed. Uh, Will Bowman showed a video from Aleph Beta. Aleph Beta is an Orthodox Jewish organization that puts together yes. teachings, but they're like video teaching. So I would compare it kind of to the Bible Project, but from like a Jewish perspective. Right. Very, very well done videos where they're breaking down uh, portions of Scripture. Obviously, they're doing it a lot more from a Hebrew perspective, which is also very cool to yeah. get some, some nuggets and insights uh, from there that you wouldn't get just from reading it in English. Right. But I'm reading this and it says, okay, so the people that shema his voice, right, obey his voice and keep his covenant, they shall be a peculiar treasure above all people. But then he says, for all the earth is mine. Why do you think he tells us that all the earth is mine? Pastor? The, why all the earth is mine? Why does he tell us that? Though? I mean, he tells us you'll be a peculiar treasure above all people for all the earth is mine. Why do you think he tells us that? Because it's true. Well, first off, it's true, but... I think that he's trying to show you that he's making a distinction. He owns the whole earth yeah. and all the people in it. So it's one thing if you like, okay, I gave this example, I think last night. If you're an only child and your parent tells you, you're my favorite kid, doesn't really matter, does it? It's not really a big deal. Right. right? But if they have eight children, yeah. right? And you say, hey, you're my favorite kid. Yeah. That kid stands out above the rest. Yeah, that right? worked out really good for Joseph. <laughs> no. 17 year old know it all ends yeah. up in a pit yeah well you know what what god what man meant for evil god meant for good amen you know I, uh, romans eight twenty eight says god works all things together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose i tell i tell my teenagers i said you know joseph was a dreamer <laughs> and he had uh he had some uh knowledge yeah and uh, he ended up in a pit that's right that's, uh, that's good encouraging words there, Pastor Nick. I appreciate that. So well, yeah. Definitely need to learn the lessons so that you don't have to relearn them, right? The lessons from the examples that we that's have. It. All right, so then it says here, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So I was trying to understand what the point in understanding that was. And so what is the job of a priest? So from that video teach from the Torah. Beta, yeah. teach the Torah, but what else? What else did the priest do? Because remember the video that Will showed yeah. on, on uh, Shabbat? They're supposed to teach the Torah and live it. They live it, live it but they also, it. they're a go-between. They're a bridge, right? right. So they, to God, the priest represents the people. Right. But then to the people, the priest represents God. 
Right. And so they, they do this go-between action. So if we who obey the voice of God and keep his covenant become a peculiar treasure unto him yeah. and a, a, a nation of priests, right. then we become God's representatives on the earth. I wonder who he's writing that letter to, say the Gentiles or the, mm. the church? or You know, that's an interesting question. So I tie this in because I, I feel like if we become God's representatives on the earth, I wanted to know, is that in the New Testament? Do you think that's in the New Testament? I think it's in the And the word peculiar is actually used, too. It is. It is, because it's. you said that was in what, 1 Peter? I keep S- Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9. That, the word peculiar is also used in the Greek like yeah. it would be in the Hebrew word peculiar. I think it's, I think I'm so he ties it. it in, which is kind of interesting. So it's, it's got to be the same, have the same connotation. The books in the New Testament are so much smaller, so I like always pass stuff. It's so hard to find Obadiah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could be on half a page. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's in it's it's in the letter to the Corinthians, and it, and God uh, or Paul says that. Uh, oh, here it is. It's chapter five, verse twenty of Second Corinthians, and it says, "Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God." So that's that's what. God is doing through us is he's trying to he's making us ministers of reconciliation he's making us priests so now that we believe on his son we now represent his son to the world just like it says here those that obey his voice indeed and keep his covenant right that we now become ambassadors for God right and what a whole and a yeah. holy set apart nation it's really different from all the rest very of the nations. interesting so I hear that and that sounds cool right you're above all people but now there's this responsibility that we've been given so here's the fact of the matter if you're in Christ, if you believe in Yeshua, you're saved, you've, you're born again, then you, like it or not, are an ambassador for Jesus. But I mean, here's the question. Man. Are you a good ambassador? Right? Are you saying what the Father tells you to say? Are you doing what the Father tells you to do? Are you representing well among the nations? Because you think about an ambassador represents the president to other That's countries. That's a good point. How well are we doing in that ambassadorship? Right, we need to be mindful. And if you're in Christ, you're the seed of Abraham. Because remember, we're, we've died to ourselves, and we now live in Christ. Right. So it's not us who lives, but Christ lives in us. Yes, He's putting it all together. So we represent Him on the earth. We need to be good ambassadors. Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. So we get into Exodus chapter 19, verses 7 through 13, the giving of the Torah. Here we go. What was the response of the words of the Lord to Moses from the people? All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. So they said, I do. Was the word of the Lord to Moses to be believed forever? Uh, yeah, it actually says the word um, forever. <laughs> wow. I always find the word forever interesting. Does it really mean forever? So all that you say to do, we will do. And his words are forever. Very yeah, interesting. The right. concept of that. Uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. And let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, verses 10 and 11. Notice that. Sanctify them. Be ready against the third day. Mm. So they're going to wash their clothes. That is very, very interesting. You know, um, the act of washing and preparing serve to get their minds and hearts ready. When we meet God for worship... We should set aside the cares and preoccupations of everyday life. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to sanctify something? Set it apart. To be set apart. Right. To prepare it for a purpose, right? Today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. Mm -hmm. For the third day, the Lord will come down on the side of all the people upon Mount Sinai. I'm quickly going to go over to Hosea real quick here because there's something going on here that we need to understand more than anything. So just so you understand the, con- the connotation here, two days they're preparing, and the third day he's coming down. It's going down on the third day. Okay. Just like in the, in the, in the, in the, in the tomb. On the third day, something incredible is going to happen. I just got this revelation. Mm. And maybe you can agree with me. I, I think just, I'm something's agreeing so go- far. Something's going on here. Only because here we are with the Torah, Christians with Torah. In Hosea 6.1, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. Mm. 
In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now, this is an interesting point. So for 2,000 years, a day is still as 1,000 years. 1,000 years is one day, based upon what Moses said in the psalm. And then Peter quotes Moses, right? Okay, so they're preparing for two days. But on the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. That's why we have the Torah. I on like the third this. day, we got the Torah because the Torah was given, uh, you know, 3,500 years ago, but I'm saying as far as writing it on minds and hearts after those days in Jeremiah 31. Well, to your point, specifically, Hosea is a correspondent prophet to the northern kingdom. Yeah, to the, the northern kingdom. The outcasts of Israel, those yeah. that are scattered. Now, now it says, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. So he came in the fall, and then, of course, you got the early and the latter rain, and then he yeah. died in the spring. So there's early and latter rain kind of there compared with Yeshua when he came. Right, right, but, right. But I say this word revive is very interesting because it's the same word used to describe Jacob seeing the wagons that Joseph had sent. He actually was revived. It's almost like the connotation is you, you come back from the, it's like coming back from the dead. Yeah. To revive something. It was dead. He thought he would never see Joseph again. And when he saw those wagons. He was revived. This is what's so exciting about us being grafted into the olive tree as Israel. So I want to bring that point out. The two days of preparing, the third day of living in his sight. So then so then a day is a thousand years, is a thousand years is a day with the Lord. Right. So it's been two thousand years. Yes. We're now going into that third day. And that's why we're seeing it. So that's things. why we're getting the Torah. That's why again. we're getting it. Right. So they had three days of preparation, and then the Lord was going to come down on the sight of all the people. The meaning of the number three is divine and of the Lord. You know, a second witness for that is Ezekiel's prophecy of laying on his side. That's very interesting. Multiplied too. Yeah. by the seven times. Yeah, it, it comes out to like 2008 or something. Right, yeah. right, right. It's but, very but interesting. But that's a second witness to that there's, same there's thing. There's something I'll punish you seven times more for your sins. That's a whole other world. Yeah. What did the Lord want Moses to set up around Mount Sinai to keep the people from dying? He wanted them to put bounds, boundaries. So like a fence. Is yeah, what so I bounds. Some sort of fence. Boundaries are, are in a marriage. You have boundaries. Mm. And so now we have the stage. It's being set up. And now I turn it over to Ryan. So what your supposition here is, is that since the people said everything that you say to do will do, this is a marriage covenant that's being made between the people of Israel at the base of Sinai and with God. A greater vessel versus a a lesser vessel. Correct. And so you're then saying the boundaries that every marriage should also have good boundaries. You got to have boundaries. Lest you you die. (laughs) Like, let's say you don't come home and you're married. Oh, I was just out all night. No, you need to tell me where you're going, what you're doing. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, my wife's going out of town. I'm watching three girls, and Ooh. you're going to like it. Yeah. I am. Uh, you are going to like but it. But it's like, you got to have communication. <laughs> oh, I thought I was watching one. Or Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, just yeah. take those with you. No, 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 no. All right, so let's keep going. Uh, we're at chapter 19, verses 13 through 20 now in the book of Exodus, and this is the giving of the Torah. So we're going to get some, some, uh, this is it. some interesting going media. down. So in Exodus 19.15, Moses instructs the husbands not to be intimate with their wives because they needed to be ready for the Lord on the third day, right? So no physical affection. So I had the kids last night, but I liked this. So I said, hey, you guys all have moms and dads, right? And they were like, yeah. And I said, do they ever like, do you ever see like, and you know, like kind of barking back at you? They're like, no. And they're like, you know, some of them are like, yeah, yeah. definitely. You know? Those are my kids. Apparently every house. Oh, yeah. The moms and dads, you Something's know, going down. squabble a little bit, right? Squawking. So the point is that if you want to be focused on something, then you need to put away these other things. Because if you're trying to focus on a relationship with the Lord, your relationship with the Lord, like, no one's going to stand before the Lord with you. Not your wife, not your kids, not your friends, not the people that you work with. It's you and the Lord. And so That's that has good. to be an individual, personal relationship. That's a good word. And if you want to bring something to the marriage from the Lord, you have to first be focused on the Lord on That's your own. That's a good word. Right? It is a good word. I just think right now, blessed are the peacemakers. Hallelujah. I mean, really. Yeah. Peace. Man. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> uh, so verse 16 uh, says this. It says, and it came to pass on the third day. So, okay, we were just talking about be ready for the third day. Yeah. Now we're, we're coming to the third day. So it says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Wow. So this is the first time the trumpet or the shofar has ever sounded, and it's in Exodus nineteen sixteen. 
In the law of first mention, it is to, uh, or the law of first mention would be to remember that the first time something is referred to in the Bible, that this is the original meaning, right? So it's just an explanation of the law of first mention, that this is the original meaning of the blowing of the shofar. And so in this example, the blowing of the shofar over the children of Israel is all about entering into a marriage covenant. You know, it's interesting. Only God would get married in the morning. <laughs> He's a morning person. Can you, have you ever been to a wedding? Hey, we're having our wedding at 10 a.m. No, I've never heard that. I've never heard of it's it. Always either. in the evening, so you can party in the, the evening. Bunch of bunch of procrastinators. <laughs> so I got a couple things here, right? So obviously, the word trumpet here in chapter nineteen sixteen is the word shofar, right? And this is, as you said, the first mention of it. But I was thinking about this, right? I was thinking about this, and I was like, the thunders and the lightnings. Now I've been. You know, this is just a personal experience I have sitting in my house, on a little chair by a window. And I remember like lightning or something struck like right there in the yard next to where I was, right? And let's just say I got up pretty quickly and I did not stay next to that window. Yeah. Now there's one other time on my property where I was up, up by the gate and lightning struck somewhere near where I was and I ran back to the house. <laughs> so <laughs> I, oh. I think about that and then I think about oh. these people at the base of Sinai. But it's on the top of the mountain that it's happening. Yeah, but I mean, Still. I don't know how tall Sinai is, but like... The mountains cover with thunders and lightnings. That's Soon, still pretty close. You know, think about it. Once they open up Saudi Arabia to Mount Sinai, you uh, talk about tourism? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, they're already starting. Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. It is absolutely in Saudi Arabia. There's some good documentaries about that. Yeah. Like the Sinai Peninsula is a, a misnomer. Well, you know, the, the thing I want to point out, geographically speaking, or even with archaeology, there's not one bit of proof of Mount Sinai being in the nation of Israel. It's or just, being in Egypt. There's mean. no... Sinai. Well, Peninsula. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah Egypt or Israel. But it yeah. looks like they got it down south, part yeah, of Israel. Yeah, right, right, right. The, what they call the Negev. But no, what I'm saying is that there's not one bit of archaeological evidence that there was right. nobody there. Right, 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 right. Matter of fact, you can't even camp around this certain mountain that wouldn't even be appropriate. Like, yeah. How could you do two million people? Yeah. So you have to look at a Mount Sinai that's in Saudi Arabia that could accommodate the plane. Oh, but they certainly have found archaeological evidence. That'd over be something worth Arabia. seeing again, for sure. Oh, it's, it's four Ma- hours long. Yeah, it's Mount great. Sinai in Saudi Arabia. They've got a ton of evidence. It's it's really exciting. You know who else went there? What is that guy? Why can't we get that on Netflix? Yeah, right. Avi Lipkin, I know, sells that book on his website, I believe, or the the video, um, the Caldwells, right? Oh yeah. Um, but then, uh, what's the guy's name that wrote the book about where the Temple Mount is? It's, it's not a great book, but it was, uh, what's the guy's name? He's like a ex cop, does investigations. He did another video on the location of Sinai. Interesting. And he claims that it's in the same place as well. Wow. Um, he also did something on the, uh, location of the ark and stuff like that. All right, too. let's keep this so, thing moving. Yes, sir. All right, so. Let's discuss. Well, your what about, don't forget in Zechariah nine fourteen it says that Yahweh blows the shofar over his people. Hmm. Remember that? Mm-hmm. We don't have to go there, but it's yeah. very interesting. And the reference is Ephraim and Judah. Ephraim is the, is the arrow and, and Judah is the bow. And it says he shoots out the arrow and there's a trumpet being blown by God in Zechariah 9 to 14. So, I love it. I know. So I love that's it. something to look at later. Yeah. I also he, think about the shofar, right? And right. So discuss your personal experience with the shofar and how it's impacted your life. I have two things. Uh, back in 1995 when I got my Hebrew roots, that's when I was exposed to the shofar, mm-hmm. I would say. And then uh, I bought a shofar in the highest city found in Israel called Zephat. Hmm. Now it's an art colony, but uh, supposedly that's where uh, Kabbalah was founded, Jewish oh, mysticism. Good. But, but it's the highest city yeah. in Israel. But now it's an, it's an art colony. Now it's an art colony. Zephat. Makes sense. The highest city in Israel. Yeah. yeah, it would make sense to have the beginning of Jewish mysticism or Kabbalah founded there. Yeah, well, and uh, an art colony. But now, now it's, yeah, yeah, it's pretty much uh, an art colony. But the highest city in Israel is Zafat. I got me my little black sh- uh, shofar, little little handheld one. Ah, okay. Get to blow it yeah. pretty good. So I, um, my first experience with the shofar, I remember somebody blowing a shofar at a church I used to go to. And it was some event or something, and some I think it was a guest speaker on, on they would have like a special service on a Wednesday night, and uh, I remember hearing that noise, you know, that sound, and being like, oh, okay, you know. But as I came into the Hebrew roots, I'll tell you what, like I would, especially when I first started coming here to Beit Tehillah, when I would hear the shofar blown, it like it like did something inside like my soul, like I would just like I would pierce me, I would hear it and and feel it at the same time, and and I don't know. 
of other sounds that do that. You know what I mean? But like you hear a shofar and like, you know, like a dog, your ears perk up, perk up, you know? And, uh, and for sure, you know, the shofar is used for calling the bride because we gather people all That's the time. That's the law first mentioned. Below the shofar. Well, number's 10. It tells you what the shofar is blown for. Yeah. And for alarms. An alarm, an yep. assembly. An assembly. You know, they said that during promise keepers meetings, I guess it was in somewhere they had this, it was a gathering of men or, or, or in a religious event, whatever it was. But I've heard testimonies of people that said that when they heard the shofar, men actually fell to the to their face. That was their reaction. They just fell on their face in Praise humility. God. Just it hit them. They heard it and their body just went down. Yeah. And it was like a, a spiritual experience. It's interesting. We were reading before we started doing this uh, in Corinthians um, about, you know, tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophesying and all that. But he compares it to the shofar and how the a shofar. Voice. Right. Or, but of a, of a the sound of a, a mighty trumpet, rushing wind. Yeah. But the sound of a trumpet. Yeah. Meaning like if you don't give it intonation on the on when you blow the shofar, do you know if it's the calling of the assembly? You know, it actually. It, or the alarm. It, it actually was a voice. Invasion? You're right. Yeah. The trumpet was a voice of God. Yeah, Absolutely. Like Yovel, whatever. Yovel is a jubilee. Oh, or what is it called? Teruma or something? Yeah, well, Teruma is to blow, yeah. For but sure. I mean, but but the connotation was there was a voice. Yeah. Yeah, so. Absolutely. All right. So that's my experience with the shofar. I, uh, I you know, I love the blowing of the shofar. And I know that um, the blowing of the shofar in and of itself doesn't have like some supernatural power, right? It's not a, a, it's not a magic stick that you blow and now... You've changed the right. the whatever. Well, it says that when the trumpet blows, the demons flee because they're scared. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing I think about. I think about that anything like that that you do by faith, right? There's certain actions that we take in the natural that have supernatural uh, effects. So, like Yeshua, all through his ministry, as we've been reading through Matthew, he says, "According to your faith, let it be unto you." Right. So, for the person that says, "Hey, all you have to do is say the word, and she'll be healed." Hey, come and touch them, and they'll be healed. Hey, if I just touch your garment, I'll be healed. Whatever this person felt to do, right. right, that the Holy Spirit led them to do, that was the action God wanted them to take. If they do it in obedience right. and by faith, they received the reward that they were looking that's for. That's true. And so I think that the shofar, that you can compare that to the shofar, because I know there's people that and will... And it's a sign of the last days. Oh, for sure. That was sure. the thing that was brought into the church. That's right. To wake the bride up. That's right. Wake up! All right, so in Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 and also in verse 7, the children of Israel agreed to all the words of the Mosaic Covenant. So we would call this covenant colloquially as we study the Mosaic Covenant because it comes through Moses, right? Comes through Moses. Um, and so here's a good question. What is the sign of the Mosaic Covenant as found in chapter 31, verse 13? It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the sign of the covenant. Now, the Sabbath is the sign of the covenant. Yes. That's right. And so um, the giving of the Torah was a marriage covenant between God and the children of Israel. It was even ratified by the sprinkling of blood upon the people. Now, this is interesting. What does it mean to ratify something? Right? Wow. It means to make it official, to seal it. So like the Declaration of Independence, which was written by Thomas Jefferson, it didn't become part of our nation's official history until the men signed it and ratified it. They made it official. They sealed it with their signature, right? That's Same good. thing with the Constitution. So in this case, we're talking about the ratification by the sprinkling of blood. Um, but I've got, I want to read these verses in uh, 3113 because... So how was the Constitution ratified? Through the signatures? Through the signatures, exactly right. That's because, good. okay, so like with the Constitution specifically, these men were not just putting their signatures, right? They represented the states that they came from, right? They were the official representatives. So where they came from, there was some official process of making them the representatives of their territories. So the U.S. Constitution was ratified by their signatures. By their signatures. Now, uh, again, real quick, I want to read true. the Sabbath. What good would that be? is the sign of the covenant. So check this out, right? We've been going through this. The artisans, they start building the, the tabernacle and the furniture and stuff like this. And, and it says here in verse 12 of chapter 31, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbaths, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Now, check this out. If you accidentally, you know, by working or whatever, it's just cut off. 
But if you're profaning, so those people that speak against the Sabbath or that are willfully and diligently like trying to defile the Sabbath. God forbid you pick up sticks. Well, that's okay, Aiken. Poor Aiken. No, it wasn't no, that was Aiken. Aiken. No, you're right. That wasn't Aiken. Aiken that was, was, uh, that kept was his, keeping the... Uh, that was his cousin. Yeah, it was Aiken's no, cousin. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. I know. It's, it's tough. The principle. So, so work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. So throughout their generations... Perpetual covenant. You caught that so you got far? got it. All right, keep going. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel for 20 years. Forever. Forever. Wow. Forever, forever, forever. So I'd only read that so that people can get the understanding that God himself is speaking to Moses and saying these words. Say, hey, this is what I want you to write down. I want you to go tell the people. This is a sign of my covenant forever. Now, Forever means forever. So he says it three different ways, just in case we didn't get the memo. Throughout your generations, perpetual covenant forever. Right? So that's three wow. different ways that he's telling us. That's awesome. This is going to last forever. <laughs> Sorry. Hopefully you guys understood there. That's good. That's a, you know, the, there's so much yeah. so this that we is, have in this. This is a uh, Pastor Nick Plummer specialty here. What yes. we're going to go into next. Teaching Torah in just five minutes. Can so many people. It? So many people have approached me. Set the watch. I'm looking. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've begun sharing. So here we go. Teaching Torah in just five minutes. Mm-hmm. Everybody's come up to me and say, "How can I share Torah? This is the best way to do it." The first time that the word "law" is used in the Bible can be found in Exodus 12:49. One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. So that includes everyone. Wait, that includes everyone. That, that includes Israel and those that are homeborn and brought up and those that come alongside say, hey, we want to be a part of you. We want to be with you. Yeah. That's the, that be the person that sojourneth among you. The Hebrew word for law is uh, number 8451 in the Old Testament, and it's the word Torah. Torah. And it means a precept or statute, especially the Decalogue or Pentateuch. So there you go. The word law is English, and the word Torah is Hebrew. Pentateuch being the first five books of the Bible. Yeah, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. The word Torah comes from the Hebrew word, Yara, number 3384, and it means the following. This is what the Hebrew root word means of Torah. To flow as water, to lay or throw, especially an arrow, i.e. to shoot. Figuratively, to point out as if by aiming the finger. To teach, direct, or inform. So that's what the Torah is going to do. So that's a lot of cool stuff. To flow is water. So a lot of people become Torah terrorists, and they don't know how to flow is water. <laughs> to lay or throw is like an arrow. It, it means you hit the mark. So you know what the commandment is, and you hit the mark. You know, like, like don't eat pork chops. It's unclean. Hit the mark. That's the arrow. That's, it. that's an easy mark. Celebrate the feast days. The Sabbath. Hit the, the arrow hits the mark. Yeah. Sin is missing the mark. Figuratively, to point out as if by aiming the finger, by the finger of God, the Torah was written. Mm-hmm. By the finger of God in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, uh, Yeshua cast out devils. And he also used his finger to write to point uh, out and to teach. Write out in the sand for Ooh, those that yeah. accused the woman of adultery. That's right. They say that he was writing their names from oldest to the youngest. Ooh. And so they, the oldest to the youngest dropped their rocks in that story about adultery. So there are two main purposes for the Torah. Number one, to show us what sin is. Number two, teachings and instructions. I love it. Torah doesn't save you, it instructs you. It got principles, it's got it's got a lot of good stuff. Now that, that you're part of the kingdom, here's what you do. So here is, of course, uh, Matthew chapter five, verses seventeen through nineteen. Yeshua gives an incentive to keep the Torah. Once again, Matthew five, verses seventeen through nineteen. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men, so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But, which is in conjunction, whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So just to remind everyone that we do not want to destroy the law or the prophets. We need the prophets to tell us about the future. We have the laws, the teachings, and instructions. Now, this word fulfill in the Greek, number 4137, is the Greek word pleru. And it means to make replete, 
to cram, level up, to furnish, satisfy, execute, or execute an office, to finish, or finish a period, or finish a task, to verify, accomplish, or complete. So that, that particular reference would be applicable to us today, that we want to complete it, we want to do it. And currently, God is writing his Torah on minds and hearts and people all over the world. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. And I just have one more reference, and I know I'm under five minutes. I just know that I am. First John 3, 4. I want to conclude it with that, and I'll put it even in my notes. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Wow. Now, that Greek word is nomos, flaw, but let's go back to the Old Testament. John is emphatically stating that whoever commits sins transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Wow. So that's First John. And this is why we can empirically say a couple things about Torah um, in general. There's a lot of teachings in Christianity that will tell you, hey, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that. And, you know, I, I think what they mean when they say that is that— uh, you don't have to keep the Torah to get salvation. Right. And what happens, though, is they, they, they repeat that statement as if keeping the Torah then would somehow be trampling underfoot the cross of Christ, right? right? Is that ideology, yeah. which is really bad doctrine. Because it's clear that God gave us the Torah as the gift of his grace in our lives, Right. He says, hey, here's this gift of teachings and instructions. I'm a good father. Good fathers instruct their children. Here's my teachings and instructions. And it's like, hey, you want to be part of the kingdom? This is what we do in the kingdom, right? It, you don't get your ticket to the kingdom and then just do whatever you want, right? There's protocol and, and things like that. Now, does that mean that people that are ignorant, that, that they're going to somehow be punished? No, I don't necessarily think that's the case either. I think that what this is, is this is for our edification, for continuing the sanctification process, because here, as we're doing this, we want to, you know, he came not to destroy, right? To p fulfill, pluru, to cause it to abound. So this word fulfill is like uh, when you fill a cup until it overflows, you fill full. So like the Havdalah service, you know, where you pour the wine in and the cup overflows. And then it's, this is what God does. He pours into you so that you can then pour out to others, right? Right. And that's that, that symbology. But here's my big question for you, Pastor Nick. I got two of them. My first question for you is, to your, the best of your knowledge, are heaven and earth still here? Oh, yeah. So heaven and earth are still here? They are. Okay. Because I, I think they are, too. I personally agree with that assessment. My second question to you is, if you had to choose between being the least in the kingdom or the greatest in the kingdom, which one would you choose? You want to be great in the kingdom. I tell you what. It's I, so cool. I don't know how else to explain it to somebody. It's an opportunity that for us. simple. The That's third what, thing I want to mention is this. To argue about there's it. people that have, have twisted Paul's words to say that Paul has in some way, shape, or form done away with the need for the Torah, or that Yeshua did and that Paul explains it. If Yeshua got rid of the Torah, that would make him the lawless one. It would right. make him not the Christ. It would right. make him the Antichrist. Right. All right. And if Paul were also the one backing that up, then he wouldn't be a prophet. He would be a false prophet by the definition of false prophets in Deuteronomy. So when we take those two things, we know for sure Jesus didn't do that, and we know that Paul didn't say that. So there has to be something else. So whatever what, what the if, alternative yeah. interpretation is, that's what we need to take. See, what if Yeshua just said, I have come to fulfill these commandments, but didn't give the incentive? Well, it's like he, Donald, gives, he gives the incentive, Ryan. That's the thing that gets me. Those that teach the Torah and live it are going to be greater. So he throws that in there. He could have just said, I've come to fulfill these commandments. When he rebukes the Pharisees, he says, you should have done the former without neglecting the latter. Right. Or done the latter without neglecting the former. Right. So he never, ever, and even Paul does the Nazarite vow to prove that he's not doing away with Torah. Right. Right. So there's all of these things that, that we can consider. I think that what we're mistaking is that there's grace for new believers that are Gentiles. Right. And we want to... We don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, right? right? What we want is we want to receive the fear of God in our hearts so that we would want to do the things that he would want us to right. do and be those people. I mean, that's a lot of Torah. Now, now, now oh, we yeah. have Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, the giving of the Holy Spirit. Ryan's going to kick that off. I am. Now we have the giving of the Holy Spirit, and it's interesting that this happened in the morning, just like the Torah was given. How Elaine brought that out. 
to the day how, to how the do you, hour. How do you think about that. Yeah, in the morning. Yeah, the Torah was given. So, uh, chapter two of Acts, verses one and two, it says, "And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, so meaning Pentecost was already a day that existed, by the way, uh, which is Shavuot." Uh, it says here, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house that they, where they were sitting. So on the day of Pentecost, or Shavuot, the people were in one accord and in one place. They were literally at the right place at the right time to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And so the sound of a mighty rushing wind filled the house. That sounds pretty interesting. If I was in a place and we were doing Bible study, right? And then all of a sudden, whoosh, wind started coming in yeah. like crazy. Yeah. And then we're going to get to this next. That's why I like fire. the fan on high. <laughs> that took the sheets in. Stop. <laughs> there goes my comforter. So <laughs> there goes the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So cloven tongues as of fire sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They then began to speak with other tongues. So this is interesting, right? Uh, the word tongues here is the Greek uh, Strong's 1100, and it's the word glossa. And it means the tongue, a language, especially one naturally unacquired. Now, we talked about this, right? I was like, what does they this mean? They didn't learn it. They it was unacquired. It, it hit them. Boom. They just had it. All of a sudden, they could speak yeah. the language. So the tongues that were spoken were understood by all the individuals in their own language as they received the message of the Lord. So remember that? You had said this earlier, right? These are, wait, these are Galileans. How are they? How am I understanding them speaking my language? You know, I'm from, from Rome. I'm from, you know, Asia Minor. I'm from... Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans. So we're going to get into all these other nations that were there. But just so you understand, it was the, the disciples right. that began to speak in these languages so that they could understand. Yeah, there's like 15 languages they list. Or 15 different regions of people. We're going to get from. into that. So what did others say mocking that witnessed the event? These men are full of new wine. They said they're drunk. They're huh? drunk. Yeah. Drunken. So apparently the people were acting like they were drunk as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But it was only nine o'clock in the morning, so they probably weren't drunk, right? Yeah, probably. So discuss how the Holy Spirit has touched you physically and how you reacted. I would say this: uh, it's, it's personal. Uh, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the early nineties, mm. uh, and, and a lot of times the the presence of God will make you feel lighter, mm -hmm. and you can go weak in the knees. Oh yeah. The thing I've learned uh, at the last church that I was at some time ago, Family Worship Center, uh, Pastor Reggie Scarborough was my pastor in Lakeland. He used to sell pianos, had a piano store. Oh, got called cool. into the full-time ministry. Yeah. But uh, very successful ministry out there in Lakeland. But um, I'll tell you, the interesting thing was like, like, you know, if you go to the front of the church... Boy, that's where the anointing is really, really heavy. It's kind of like God designed it that way. So sure. like if you're in the back of the church, you can feel his presence. But as you start walking up, I felt like it got thicker and thicker yeah. the closer I got to the front of the church. Part of that obedience piece. So, yeah. So I've been, uh, you know, they say slain in the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. Uh, weak in the knees. Matter of fact, uh, I guess my son Nehemiah was given a testimony while he was in the group that he said he was out for like 30 minutes on the floor. Oh, wow. And experienced like not too long ago, and he said that uh, he doesn't even remember anything. Like, like he just he can't believe he was there for thirty minutes on the floor. Wow, I know. So, so you know, and and also I want to say this to everyone: it can be uh, abused, or it could be like for sure foolish to some people, I'm manipulated. But, but but I'm saying that I don't like like barking like dogs or rolling around. I don't know. I think you can have a manifestation or something. But we got to be careful we don't criticize it. But I would say this, though. When they came to get Yeshua in the garden, he said, I am, and they fell back yeah. under the power of God. Yeah. Uh, it actually says, and I don't have the reference or the address, when Solomon dedicated the, the temple, when he dedicated the temple, it said the ministers could not stand because of the presence of God. Mm. So it is real. Absolutely. So, so that's, that's my take on it, you know. Uh, I, was, I was prayed over. Uh, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
by Pastor Rodney Howard Brown years ago in the 90s in a foyer of a church. So, you know, I have a lot of respect for that man. And uh, my son has gone to the river and went to two years. But people can have their opinions and everything. And I'm not ashamed to sure. to speak up for a minister or a ministry or a church because everyone's got to make up their own mind. But I've had my own personal experiences with Pastor Rodney Howard Brown, even towards his giving towards my family in a time of crisis. Mm-hmm. So be careful what you criticize because, you know, you might have a different relationship with that person. Right. You know? And so that's why I think it's important that we understand that, you know. Well, and to know them by their fruit, right? Um, so what do you think, Ryan? So for me personally, uh, I, I can't say that I've ever been slain in the Spirit. I've not experienced that as of yet, although I would love to be. I mean, I just I know think that sounds mean. like a wild party, you know, just well, yeah, go, you know, get it there. But I have been compelled in many times um, by the power of God to do things where, like, I didn't have a choice, if that makes sense. Not like I was possessed, but more like I was given a, a compulsion where, like, yeah. I would, I felt like I would be tortured if I didn't, right? So me, sometimes I was coming up to the altar. It's you like, can just man, yield. Like I have to, just try to right, yield. exactly. Just yield to the Holy Spirit. Correct. Let him do the directing. Um, All right. And I've felt that for sure. Praise the Lord if we believe in that. Mm-hmm. So what three things did Yeshua say the Comforter, or the Holy Spirit, would do when he would come? In John 16... Verses seven through eleven. All right, I'll give the answers, then you can, you can kind of go over it. Sure. To reprove means to convince. Well, the world of sin. Number one. Number two, to reprove or convince the world of righteousness. Lastly, number thir- number three, to reprove means to convince the world of judgment. That's right. So, so the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So, if you want to break that down, like I did, Ryan. I mean, it makes perfect sense now. Oh yeah. Boy, then you know you have the Holy Spirit because if you don't, what? If we don't recognize sin, oh, I agree. Then, then why would Yeshua come? But He's our righteousness, and He goes to the right hand of the Father. And then the ruler of this world is, of course, judged. But you can go ahead and read, read those verses. So it says uh, in verses nine through eleven, it says John sixteen. Yes, I apologize. This is John sixteen verses nine through eleven. It says cool. of sin, because they believe not on me; of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. It's interesting. Um, you know, I, I look at this and I say, he'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and in judgment. And it says of sin, because they don't believe in me. So in order to get someone to believe in Yeshua, they first have to understand they are in sin. Yeah, the natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit. We're sinners. And so if you don't receive the sin, or the understanding that you are a sinful person, then what needs Missing you the mark for a Savior? The Torah tells us what sin is. Exactly right. Oh, that's been done away with. Really? Uh-huh. Not our sins. Yeah. And then of righteousness, because I go to the Father, my Father, and ye see me no more. He completed the, the job. So he is the righteousness, he right? He is my righteousness. Right. So we have that's received right. his righteousness upon us. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And this is that the Holy Spirit is going to show you that the devil is already judged, that his fate is already determined and so we don't have to buy into it we can just tell him what his fate is that he's already been judged amen that's a beautiful thing it is it's all about him now the other thing i think about this is he says of sin righteousness and judgment when i think about people that are filled with the holy spirit there's a lot of talk about uh the gifts of the spirit meaning like tongues interpretation of tongues prophecy those types of things right and there's a whole list of them and you can find those um in paul's letters but what I think about, the number one thing I think about, is I think about the internal relationship with God that people have through the Holy Spirit. And if it's sin, righteousness, and judgment, and these are the three markers that we're looking at, I like people, personally, that avoid sin, right? That are actively avoiding sin, doing things to avoid sin, that they're seeking after and practicing righteousness, right? They desire righteousness. You could tell people that are avoiding sin and seeking after righteousness and making good decisions. Man, those three things... Like, if, if anybody can do this, you live a good life. Avoid sin, practice righteousness, make good decisions. That's, I mean, that's like a, a recipe for, I don't know. And you know what the key ingredient is? And it can is? be done. What's the key ingredient? It does. What's the key ingredient? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Because we can't do it on our own. Oh, no, right? No There's way. just no way. We're not going to no do way. it on our own. You know, somebody said last night um, that when you read the Torah, it talks about uh, don't do this, don't do that, right? There's a lot of, like, prohibitions. Or... For things for us to do, right? You shall, you yeah, shall, you yeah. shall. But then when Jesus comes and he does 
his work. It's that I will cause, right? Because like you read the, the prophecies in Ezekiel 36, says, right. I'll put a new heart in you. I'll cause you to walk in my ways. I will do these things. You can't do anything without me. Amen. That's John Jesus 15, 5. Said, That's yeah. just a couple of verses <laughs> over here. I know. So tell us more about the comforter. All right. So um, the Holy Spirit is also called our comforter. And this is the Greek word, uh, number 3875, parakletos. And it means the following, intercessor, consoler, advocate, and one called alongside to help. Because it's also called the helper, oh, right? Oh, man, I tell you, I've been crying out to the Holy Spirit. I bet. I mean, weeping. I bet. I tell you, the Holy Spirit, whew. and that's the, that's the beauty of like, like, let's say you're under a lot of pressure or whatever, is I, I like to lay in my bed and just pull that comforter up to my neck <laughs> and put the fan on high <laughs> and just really, I actually, I just, this is my ritual. Yeah. I've got a really nice, like, sort of pillow like thing, you know, memory yeah. foam kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Green side down. <laughs> and uh, you got to make sure. And I have this long, thin pillow that I put over my face, but I also have like an eye mask. And then I can like hold this little pillow, and it's like I just really I just get into the mode. It's of like, like a movie from the eighties. How everybody wore eye masks yeah, back then. It just it helps me to rest and sleep. I feel so much more refreshed to do that. Yeah. But I would just say that more just crying out to God and saying, "Holy Spirit, comfort me. Holy Spirit, come along and say, Holy Spirit, please help me. Be desperate, you know, because yeah. gosh, it makes it so much better to come to the place of brokenness than He can really come in. Right. And He He knows that He can trust you because you'll listen. Right. See, I, I'm a reactionary person, you know. You put four quarters in me, I'm going to do something. Huh. You pull my string, I'm going to do something. <laughs> I'm a reactionary person. But i got to be proactive, not reactive. So right. he's, he's teaching me and showing me and training me to be proactive, not reactive. So, yeah. so what Amen. do you got there? Amen. So the Holy Spirit leads and the devil drives, right? Wow. The Holy Spirit leads and the devil drives. I love the fact that the Holy Spirit is a comforter um, I know, and a so helper. I know, it's the, Only John shares that. Well, you know? it's through the Holy Spirit that you have the ability to do anything for God. Right. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit then, and you're doing things in your flesh, you're ultimately never going to do what you really... We can't even do God's will right? if we got 17 works of the flesh going. Or if we do it in our own power. Right. How? Listen, how could I possibly win Jewish people over to I don't fry know. them to, to our side of the house? Yeah. How could I possibly win them over to, to come to the church at least? Yeah. Not, not evangelism, but to, to come and talk. Just here. to come and talk. How yeah. could I possibly have any power over that? None. You don't. Yeah. God's heart was opened up to Jewish people. Yeah. And that's why we're here. Yeah. To educate the pastors and the Christians. So, got a discussion? Yeah. So, discuss why it is important to be led by the Holy Spirit in your life and share some personal experiences. All right, I'll just give you one here. Well, the, you know, the Holy Spirit leads and the devil drives. In Luke 4, 1, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So uh, how was I led by the Holy Spirit? Well, he led me to, uh, to Jesus in March of 92. I got saved and born again. He led me to the three churches that I went to. Yeah. You know, matter of fact, I was at Family Worship Center, and I had a situation happen. That was so bizarre that I had actually leave the church. Oh wow! It just you know, I won't get into it, but it's just it was crazy. Yeah, uh, I was helping with the youth, and different things happened, and something happened with the youth pastor and myself, and something kind of went down. Yeah, and it was like my time was up. Yep, and I I cried. I, said, I just wept. I, I stayed there for another three months, I think, but I had to step down from the youth because because a situation that uh, happened with the youth pastor, or whatever. But it actually happened. You know, he 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 put me in charge. And then when he came back, he, you know, things happen. Yeah, you know. I got you. But, but what I'm saying is that, and I don't want to get into all of it, but I don't want to do no gossip but, or Lashon Hara or slander. But I'm just saying that God forced his hand for me to have to leave that church. So <laughs> I had to go to Valrico New Life, and that's where I met the Dreyer family. Ah, uh, see, that's what you needed to yeah. do. And see, also being led of the Holy Spirit um, to, to, uh, to, pick up a stick off a path and find out it's a Ephraim. Yeah. I'm a Ephraim. It's the stick of a Ephraim. To actually experience that is incredible. Uh, to, to to share my love for Danielle right. in Israel. Keep going. That happened. You know? So, so the, yeah, the Holy Spirit has really been leading me and guiding me. And so now it's like, um, 
something that um, that we can all use today, you know, to be led by the Holy Spirit. That is, that is the most important thing um, that I can say to anyone in this time and, and age now. And I want to encourage all of you that are listening and watching. Ryan was not raptured, okay? You can see his hand over there. He's plugging in a cord right now, just so you know. Because, you know, we're, we're very clear on the scriptures that he removes the tares first, <laughs> not the wheat. He gathers wheat into the barn. Tares are adios amigos. So bringing it back to uh, focus. I'm back. The more you wean yourself off the world. We almost lost the power. We almost lost the Holy Spirit. And we're about to talk about grieving the Holy Spirit. Listen, all I know is, is that the, the more you wean yourself off the world, the closer you get to God. Oh, absolutely. And you'll, you'll, you'll see it in your own life. You know, I, I, I talk about, I used to watch the news and I just felt led to shut that thing down because it was not benefiting me at all, especially some of the stories and different things. Nothing against social media or the culture, but I'm just saying that if you wean yourself off the world, the Holy Spirit's going to be to show you things. You know, I just That's finished right. 1 Samuel. You know, so I want to encourage all of you. There's some incredible things happening. If you'll wean yourself off the world, and draw close to him. You'll love your Bible. You'll love to pray. You know, I'm praying more for the sheep now than I've ever prayed. So the Holy Spirit's everything. And he will show you things to come. That's the future, see. You know, I remember one time I was getting ready to pull into this gas station. The Holy Spirit says, don't go in here. You know, one time I grieved and quenched the Holy Spirit. We can talk about that later. But, you know, but you don't want to do those things. You want the Holy Spirit to lead you. That's right. And not be led by your emotions or peer pressure. But say, I feel led of the Spirit. And pe the whole world could come against you. Your own leadership, your your own, whoever it is, they could actually come against you. And you'd be like, you know, poor Jeremiah, you know, he got the calling. His own family came against him. Yeah. But he knew what was coming. Poor Jeremiah. But we get the good news, though. He's restoring and regathering, Ryan. Hang around people that are gathering, not scattering. Yeah. That's all I have to say. Jesus was led of the Spirit. I mean, come on. So speaking of the Holy Spirit, uh, Ephesians 4 verse 30 says this. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of of redemption. Now, what's funny is that I read that apparently upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit while we were just sitting here. I was reading just after. I, I think that's that. a chapter that I'm going to be digging into. I think so too. I think so too. But I was just, I just was just Something's happened to be reading it. On. I don't know what I was doing. I just like happened to get there, and um, we were reading some other stuff that's in Ephesians about Ephesians two, and then I just decided, hey, let's read. Um, Oh, I probably saw because of the, the walk in the Spirit and the, all that stuff. So I say that like every day. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If Hallelujah. you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the Spirit. I mean, it's just that simple. Walk, walk in the Spirit. But grieve. I mean, who wants to grieve the Holy Spirit? What's that all about? So the word grieve here is the Greek word uh, lupeo, which is Strong's number 3076. And it means to distress, to be sad, to cause grief, to uh, be in heaviness or sorrow. So you don't want to... You don't want to make Boy, the spirit you, sad. That's don't do things that would make the spirit sad. I tell you, that's, that's worth fighting for. Oh, absolutely. You know, even though we, I know I get all worked up, I got to chill out. <laughs> I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, man. So in the same vein. Yeah, I mean, really. In gosh, First Thessalonians. It, especially with my kids. Oh, I know. Mercy and grace. All of us. Ugh. Oh. So in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, quench not the spirit. All right. And so this word quench is the Greek word uh, subinumi. Spanumi. And, Spanumi. And it is. The, it sounds like a bunch of Italian dishes. It does. It? it does. Segula. Spanumi. Yeah. Well, you, we changed up a jellia, right? Up and jellia. I don't know. Up and jellia. Up and. So this is the Strong's number 4570, and it means to extinguish, literal or figurative, or to go out. Oh my so gosh. you quit it. You're like. You're like extinguishing the flame of the Holy Spirit. Oh my God. So do not grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. I think Pastor Nick has got like a rev he's got something. I think he's gonna be I from just Samuel. thought of something. I, I want to share this because oh man, I tell you, we gotta really I think I'm getting my second wind. <laughs> okay, I want to share this because I think this is so important. Um I want to share this. First Samuel. Okay, I want to say this. All right. 
and I only use this reference because you can also find this, I believe, in, 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 in Ezekiel as well, the whole, the whole principle. Here it is. Okay. Here we go. Um, this is in regards to Eli, the, the high priest, and his two sons. And this is also about the son's wife being with child. Now, check this out. Listen to this. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. She answered not, neither did she regard it. Right? Her heart was just torn. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Oof. So Eli died, the leader, the sons, for their acts of sin and sexual immorality. And then, of course, uh, the daughter-in-law has a child that lives. The glory of God is departed, Out. but she dies. Yeah. You know, that just, that, that, that means to go out. Yeah. And I, and I believe in Ezekiel, the same thing happens. The glory of God has departed, you know. So do not grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. But yeah, so don't grieve or quench. You know, grieve, you can, you know, you can kind of, you know, get by on that maybe a little bit. Mm-hmm. You distress the Holy Spirit. I feel like I've done that. But my goodness, what if we, what if I do something out of line, Ryan? What if I take matters in my own hands and I say, no, I'm going to do this. You would birth an Ishmael. I, I would have quenched right. the Holy Spirit. So what if what if right now, you know, I'm, I'm just managing my own emotions, mm. mm-hmm. which I could do better, but I'm, grie- I'm still grieving the Holy Spirit and distressing him because I'm distressed. Right. I'm just saying there's, there's, there's something there. Absolutely, there's something there. Wow. Whew. All right, Pastor Nick, so what two points can be learned from the Torah and the Holy Spirit on the feast day of Shavuot? So... I want to just say one thing real quick. You can. Before I get into the two points. And that is, because I neglected to say this early on, so I hope people made it to this point in our podcast. But what I want to say is this, that to the day, to the hour, Shavuot started at Sinai, and the Holy Spirit was given, right? So you have spirit and truth given on the same day. Right. So God does this thing where he is fulfilling, has fulfilled, right? Or has fulfilled and is fulfilling the prophecies of the spring feast, which right. we weren't going to get into all that right now. Right. But, but the fall feasts are coming. Bo Yeshua Bo, we are looking to his coming. We are yearning for his coming. Amen. And so I just wanted to. So that. I would say this in regards to the Torah. Well, what, what do you have to say about that? The Torah gives us teachings, instructions, and it is a marriage covenant. Boom. I agree. I That's, said the Sabbath is the sign of the covenant. Which is good. I mean, what really stands out. Yep. So I want to kind of give some content there. Yep. And then the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And guide us throughout our whole life. I put, uh, you have to seek the Lord to receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. You got to seek him out and you will find him because that's a promise. You know, why don't you pray us out? Thank you. Father, we just thank you for the giving of the Torah and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the day, days of the Omer in Leviticus chapter 23 verses 15 and 16 says us to count the Omer up to 50. And so we're doing that, Father. We want to thank you that... Uh, day 50 is coming on June 4th uh, in the evening. And Father, we also want to thank you for, like I said, giving us the Torah and your Holy Spirit. Father, we lift up this event that's going to happen in a stadium in Tampa on June 5th, on the day of Pentecost. These these 50 churches are coming together to pray and to intercede for and to enter in, Father. I just pray that your Holy Spirit just envelopes that place and, and that stadium, uh, the Yankee Stadium there, the Steinbrenner Field, Father. And that Hillsborough County would be turned upside down in revival, Father. It, 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 it's, it says that it's a blue it's a blue county. It's like mostly Democrats, and red means Republican. But Father, I just believe that you'll you'll just you'll just cover this whole county, this state, by the blood of Yeshua with your Spirit. We thank you, Father, for all the souls that will be saved and won over, Father. We thank you for the. Thank you for the, the, the river and what they're doing to win souls, Father, and making a difference because uh, that is what spiritual warfare is all about, Father, is the great commission to go out 
and, and to lead people to the Lord and win and make disciples. So, Father, we, we thank you for this. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to understand this and to know this and to have the mind of Christ. And so uh, we just bless you, Father. We thank you. We're expecting great things this week. And even for the trip to Israel, 21 people that are going for Shavuot, Father, I pray that you pour out your spirit like never before. We ask this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. All right. So you're right. Today is the 45th day of the counting of the Omer. So you want to say the blessing real quick? Go ahead. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshenu B'mitzvotav V'tivanu Al Sifarat HaOmer Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, whose commandments add holiness to our lives and gives us the command of counting the Omer. Today is... 45, 45 days, days, which is six, six weeks, weeks and three, three days, days of the, the counting, counting of the Omer. Hallelujah. All right, guys, if you need to get a hold of me, you know you can get me at ryan at twopraise.net, ryan at twopraise.net, and uh, make sure you like, subscribe, do all that good stuff to hear on the podcast. You can also comment uh, on whatever platform you're on, and we will see it. Bless you. Have a great week. Mm-hmm.